All right, I expect to hear a few more because, you know, copy. All right, thank you. All right, um, this afternoon's panel, I think this is the last, um, last session for, um, for today, day two. Um, this is a panel on information security, which um, I'm sure everybody has, has um, some, um, has intersected with at, at some point. Um, can I just quickly see the hands of those who, who, um, who were affected by some kind of uh, information security, cybercrime um, incident uh, over the last, let's say, since this year? Okay, just one for two people. All right. Uh, a few more. All right. Lucky you all. But um, I'm, I'm sure that everybody has, has some take on, um, on information security, uh, opinions, um, what the issues are and so on. Um, and, and we would all agree that it's, it's, an, important, um, it's an important dimension of, of, um, of the whole digital age, information technology. We were um, just sat in some sessions um, that talked about strengthening uh, the DNS infrastructure, uh, BGP infrastructure, um, all these things by, uh, by adding uh, uh, layers or facilities inside there to, to validate or authenticate that, that, um, that data that we're getting, these bits and bytes are actually um, valid or from the right people. So um, it's, it is an issue, it's a concern, it affects critical infrastructure. Uh, but one of the things that we note is uh, within, um, within the, the Caribbean region, certainly there isn't a whole lot of um, uh, formal or rigorous treatment with this a lot of times. We do have uh, responses to security issues. Um, uh, governments and civil society both are, are making moves forward, uh, but there's still a gap that, that needs to be covered. So we're hoping in today's panel uh, to be able to bring more, more awareness of the issues, uh, to, to be able to have discussions and, and, and get um, feedback from, from experts um, in this space about what's going on and, and, and what's happening. So let me, let me introduce our panel, uh, some of which, well, at least two of, of whom you've, you've already met. Um, but just for, if there's anyone new in the room, I'm going to um, basically introduce uh, each person and then ask them to, um, after all the introductions, uh, to make some, some brief statements to start off with. And then um, we'll have some uh, uh, interaction um, on some specific matters. So. Uh, let me go from my extreme left, um, come back right, start with the lady, Elgeline uh, Martis, um, uh, doctor, yes, Dr. Martis is head of CARICERT in, in, um, in Curacao, uh, that CARICERT is a Caribbean Cyber Emergency Response Team, it's the National CERT founded by BTNP with a focus to offer its services to the whole Caribbean region. Elgeline used to live in the Netherlands um, uh, where she received her bachelor's uh, degree in informatics and a master's in management um, of information and technology. Uh, Elgeline is working for more than 20 years in the IT sector in highly secure environments. Since 1991, she started at the Dutch Ministry of Defense as a wide area networking engineer and in 1999, she started at TNO, which is a Dutch independent research institute, doing research on um, uh, information security for the Dutch military, NATO, and the Dutch government. In 2006, she moved to Curaçao, her home island. From 2006, she has worked at UTS, which is a local telecom company in Curaçao, as an IT security policy advisor. And since uh, 2011, she has been at CARICERT. So uh, thank you, Algeline, for joining us today. Um, we just heard from um, Alvaro, um, but let me remind you um, of who uh, Alvaro is. Um, he's a, a distinguished engineer in Cisco Technical Services, where he works on strategic customer enablement. Uh, previously, Alvaro was a distinguished technologist in the Advanced Technology Group um, at HP Networking, where he led the definition of strategy and technical direction for OpenFlow and software-defined networking. He originally worked at Cisco Systems from 1995 to 2011 as a principal engineer in Network Software and Solutions Technology Group. 
and the, uh, the leading core IP technology architecture team. Alvaro is widely recognized for his expertise in routing protocols and network design and architecture. He's a Cisco certified internetworking engineer, CCIE, as well as uh, uh, CCDE, that's a Cisco certified design expert, and one of only a handful of people who have achieved the CCAR, which is Cisco certified um, architect certification, one of the more recent ones. Um, he is an al um, active participant in IETF, um, where he co-chairs the Routing Air Working Group and is a member of the Routing Air Directorate, um, has authored several RFCs on routing technology, has published four technical books and been awarded more than 35 patents by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. His current interests include software-defined networking, energy efficiency, infrastructure security, router protocols, and other related topics. Alvaro holds a BS degree in electrical engineering from the University of Costa Rica, where he originally came from. And he was born and raised in San Jose, now lives in North Carolina with a wife and two sons. Okay. And um, Carlos Martinez, uh, Carlos Martinez Cagnazo, has a degree in electrical engineering and has worked in the field of IT computer networks and telecommunications for more than 10 years. His expertise includes IP network planning, operations, and maintenance of Uruguay's largest ASP, and has also participated in various computer security um, and software development projects. His field of interest include security, routing, network engineering, DNSSEC, um, since 2010, Carlos has worked as the research and development engineer at LACNIC, where his main interests and current projects include um, resource certification, RPKI, IPv6, and DNS. He also teaches at the university level in the field of computer networks. All right, so um, we have a, a very distinguished, um, very expert panel uh, with us. So I'm hoping that um, we will all make use of, of the opportunity that we have to, to speak with them. I don't want it only to be um, uh, them telling us things, but also want um, with this opportunity to get a lot of um, uh, issues that we may have, questions that we have in our, the back of our minds um, answered, right? So uh, I want to start by, by basically um, just asking the, the panelists to, to briefly talk um, about um, uh, general security issues and uh, trends that they are aware of in the Latin America and, and Caribbean region related to internet infrastructure, um, uh, public services, um, enterprise customers, uh, security issues, threats, um, trends, and so on. Um, any recent developments in the region um, related specifically to cybersecurity threats, um, C certs. Um, the uh, increased um, uh, hacktivism, um, those, those sorts of things, and any specific work that they've been doing um, in these areas. So this is a, a, a part of, of, of our session in which just want the, the panelists to make some brief comments, um, uh, give some, some background and their viewpoint on the whole uh, security landscape, um, particularly in, within the region or um, from their er area of, of expertise. So. Um, let me start with Elgeline, if you will. Good afternoon. You can hear me? Okay, yes, okay. Um, okay, let me start um, like this. I am from uh, Curaçao. We are now starting uh, a CERT in Curaçao, that's the Cyber Emergency Response Team. And um, we started this last year, so it's not so long. Um, why do we need a cyber emergency response team? Um, it's because um, the security threats and vulnerabilities are increasing and they are getting critical uh, for business, for personal use. So. They started with the cyber emergency response teams. They called them a lot of uh, names like c search CERT, uh, CIRC, uh, all kind of names. But they are all about incident handling. When, when you have 
um, like security breaches in networking or malware attacks, hacking, all kind of stuff. Um, the certs are mainly um, responsible for doing the incident handling, incident management. And the goal of a cert, C cert, is to help the customer as fast as possible. It's like a fire brigade. So when a customer is being hacked or has some problem with DNSSEC or something like that, you can approach your C cert and the C cert will as soon as possible help the customer to find a solution to fix the problem. A C cert will not, um, let's say, um, of, uh, let me say, there are different kinds of C certs. You have C certs on national level, like we are in Curacao, but you have also company C certs. You have also branch C certs, like a bank of banking can have banking C certs who focus on banks, but you can also have uh, like a regional C cert, like we have the Asian Pacific C certs. Um, we have coordination C certs, like the ZCC. And um, you can have also a C-cert in a company. It doesn't have to be a big team. Maybe it's one or two people. But as soon as they handle, uh, do they do incident handling, they can call themselves C-cert if they comply with some uh, requirements. So we need uh, those people nowadays because the internet uh, issues are getting sometimes way above the what the companies can handle. So they all seek some help, and the C-cert model is getting bigger and bigger as the vulnerabilities are getting bigger. So we are CARI-CERT in the Caribbean, and we are a national CERT in Curaçao, but we are focusing to offer our services in the Caribbean. Um, in 2008, I think it was, LACNIC was also in Curaçao, so we are very happy they are coming this year again. And it was at the LACNIC meeting in 2008 that Curaçao learned about CSERTs, and our government was very uh, enthusiastic with the information they got at that time. So my boss, that is from Bureau Telecommunication and Post in Curaçao, started the research to get uh, the CERT in Curaçao going on. From that time, we are digging in the CSERT world, getting information, do all the organization stuff to start the CSERT in Curaçao. A lot of preparation, a lot of organization, a lot of uh, technical issues, let a lot of uh, um, human resource issues. Uh, it's very difficult to get um, specialized uh, uh, stuff, etc. To go back on the on the part of uh, what are what is going on in internet security and the trends, what you see is that um, in the Caribbean we don't have much information about about how big is the problem in the Caribbean. Um, we have some um, how you say some calculations and some assessment and some speculations, but we don't have figures to say how big the problem of cybersecurity is in the Caribbean, and that is because um, the Caribbean is still not very organized on sharing information on cybersecurity. And there already I mentioned one important item, that is sharing of information. Um, the hacking world, hackers who are gaining a lot of money of out of hacking, they are very organized, they are well organized, they help each other very good, and we who are supposed to defend the internet and um, build and offer the me measurements and help our customers, we are not well organized. So that is already one problem we have um, with solving this issue. We also need to do more cross-border um, coordination. Um, most of the time hacking and threats are coming not, most of the time not from your own um, um, your own island or our country, very very um, most of the time is re, um, international um, attacks. 
So we need some cross-border coordination and uh, cooperation to solve the issues also. Nowadays, the hacking and the threats and the attacks are getting fast and they're getting smart, um, difficult to, to, to find traces, they are getting complex, they are persistent. So you need a good team and you need to have information from the other side of the world to help you. I was some weeks ago in Washington where we had a meeting with the OAS and it was very interesting to see how also they focus on the legal issues because um, there is a big discrepancy um, on the legal frameworks of the different countries. Um, my um, legal system is not your legal system, it's not the other's legal system. Uh, while some com uh, countries will fight for privacy, the other ones don't care about privacy. So if I have a breach of um, privacy in my country and I reach out for you to help me with my privacy issue, but in your country it's not a problem, so there it will stop. So there is also a need for aligning um, the legal frameworks and uh, to start writing legislation because um, many, many small islands don't even have uh, um, the law in place to handle with um, this kind of uh, threats. And um, also what you see nowadays, the last trend they told us about what is happening is that the new, the new form of hacking is not only to get your information and get your money, but there is a new trend of destroying the data. So you will lose everything. So now we have a more um, bigger urgency to um, find um, solutions for the hacking. Another problem is the budget issue. Financially, many um, small companies and countries cannot handle the um, getting more and more expensive of equipment and security measures. It's very difficult to um, implement uh, expensive uh, um, equipment and solutions. Um, the use of uh, open source will help, but when you really need solutions, you have to go and buy expensive uh, tools. So it's a big issue also when small countries and companies have to make choices uh, whether to um, employ your functionality or your security. So yeah, these are the, the, the trends and what is happening now. Um, one other thing is also that nowadays hacking and, and, and attacks are happening in seconds, in minutes. Um, in one minute, 10 minutes, they can get in and go away with big sum of money. And when you have the legal framework and the lawyers and the legal, or, or they are taking weeks and months to help uh, solve those issues. So most of the time they will not be, s be solved anyway. So these are what I have to share with you today about um, what is going on in this world. I've been playing with this microphone for days and I still yeah. can't get it to do what I want. So um, what my job makes me do uh, is more along the side of infrastructure security. So I interface with customers not just here in the region but across uh, the world basically on topics like the ones we talked earlier around uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure protection, um, the routing system. So I've been active in the ATF and inside of Cisco looking at those types of solutions for the last uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, there is already, as we just finished talking, a lot of work going on in the region uh, by creating certificates, et cetera, on the side of LACNIC to get awareness to uh, try to diminish this problem uh, a little bit. The other part of the infrastructure security is not just the critical uh, pieces of it, but the fact that, as you all know, security is really a layer game. It is about putting layers not that are going to solve all the problems, but layers that are going to deter and slow down people before they actually get to their objective. So when we look at um, infrastructure security, we look at uh, 
protecting the different pieces of the network as hosts, as transit, as a networking system so that we can get information across or information in it that has to go into uh, the network or out of the network, including routing or management. How do I uh, design a secure management infrastructure, for example, so that I can continue operation of my network without um, interruption in the face of a denial of service attack, for example? Um, how do I react, or even first, even more important, detect a denial of service attack? And, and I believe that the network is becoming more important in that sense because the network, of course, sees everything. It sees everything that's going through the network, where it's coming from, where it's going to, what kind of traffic profile do we have. So, so I see a, a growing trend, not just in the, in the region, but uh, worldwide, on using that network information to uh, collect data, NetFlow, for example, or, or IPFIX, uh, to analyze data, not only to react with known threats through an IDS or an IPS, but to analyze and run analytics on the data, to look at normal traffic patterns, to look at abnormal traffic patterns, to even sometimes, when, when possible, look at uh, the content of some of the traffic that's going, especially when we talk about enterprise networks, where there's a little bit more control of what goes in and out, what type of communication is, is, is important. So I see that as a, as a growing awareness of the fact that there um, are many types of threats and that using the network gives us another tool to be able to extract information to then, as I said, detect, mitigate, react to, uh, et cetera, what, what's happening um, in there. Um, you know, along that, the other, in my mind, the other clear trends are around um, the separation or, or actually the disappearance of separation in data sources and data use. Uh, the trends of BYOD, where everyone brings their phone and their tablet and their PC and everything else to work. And the fact that now companies have that separation to deal with, or basically that lack of separation. How do I keep my employees from using their phone for both work and uh, personal use and having that bleeding of information back and forth. Uh, it, it is now a lot easier to load unsecured applications. Uh, during lunch, my friend uh, William over there from Venezuela was talking about the, the fact that he lost his phone or your wife got his phone stolen. And uh, he went to the Android um, app store and he loaded an app and he was controlling the phone while well, the person who had stolen it had it. And he could do things around monitoring calls and looking at texts and sending texts to the phone, taking pictures of the, of the uh, perpetrator remotely, doing a lot of these things. Well, how do we, as, as an enterprise, control and mitigate security of information? When in that same phone, we have work data we have not only a work email, we have access to the corporate network, but we also use it for personal use. So those types of, of, of trends are, are important in, in a region where um, wireless access is, of course, an important part of everyday use, becomes a very critical matter in terms of controlling information flow and, and the security of that information. We already talked a little bit about uh, coordination and um, awareness of threats. Uh, along those lines, I think it's really important, the, obviously, the educational part, not only for understanding what may be a threat in the infrastructure or not, but also education in terms of avoiding what I believe is still a, a very big threat in, in general, which is social networking. It, it is not a threat directly to the network, but a threat of me getting credentials or getting access to credentials just through social networking, either through the conversations we have in the hall that you tell me your password and without knowing, or uh, there are many cases, documented cases of people calling a bank and saying, hey, uh, my name is Alvaro and blah, 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 and getting information about my accounts, for example, or access to, to my money, not that I have any, but you know, access to whatever I have there. Um, so social networking is still a very 
big threat. It's a big threat not only for personal security, but it goes beyond that into corporate security and, I don't know, maybe even national security. Um, so just as a summary, uh, my work is mostly on the infrastructure side. How do we protect, but also, more importantly, how do we use the network as a security tool to respond, to detect, uh, to mitigate uh, different types of attacks. And many of the threats that I see emerging in general are, are more social in kind. Social networking, the use of tablets and, and BYOD type devices that make that separation between life and work uh, or between uh, personal life and work um, a lot more blurry and create a lot more challenges in, in the network industry. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I've been working in Lange for three years now, and uh, being there provides m provided me with an opportunity to actually witness how quickly the, inter the internet in the region has been growing. Uh, Luisa will probably comment on that, uh, about the how the mem membership has grown, things like that. Uh, it all goes to say how, how strongly has the region embraced the internet as a tool for running our everyday lives. Um, with every new tool, with every new public that starts using the internet, um, a new set of challenges came in. So we have also witnessed over the past few years things like hacktivism. This is even a word that even ex didn't even exist uh, like, I don't know, a year ago or something like that. Uh, uh, we started seeing uh, large denial of service attacks in the region that didn't ha used to happen in big, uh, in big numbers before. Um, and uh, other concerns as well. Spam has been one that has been there for a long time now, but uh, we, have s we are now used to receive phishing emails, for example. Uh, for example, the community in Brazil has been rife with uh, phishing and malware. Uh, they have a very heavy use, uh, use of, uh, for example, online banking in Brazil, and they have these huge phishing communities that uh, are basically running a, a huge enterprise there. This is, there are, these are things that we need to address if we want to this, if, we are actu if you actually believe that the internet is something good for society, which I think we all believe that. And, um, Again, I think one of the main challenges in improving the security in the network is, it is twofold actually. One is what Alvaro has been describing, which the our duty as operators and as engineers to secure the infrastructure in the network. And the other challenge is actually realize that most of the new users that are coming to the internet, that are embracing the internet as a tool for their lives are non-technical. Uh, my mother couldn't care less about an antivirus or things like that. Uh, he doesn't even want to be concerned with that. Actually, he he bypassed the PC completely and went straight to, straight to the iPad, for example. And uh, it's to that public, with that public in mind, we need to think about how we do outreach, how do we provide, I wouldn't say training, but awareness and how do we provide them with the tools, not tools in the sense of software, but tools in, the terms of, in, in terms of common sense, basically, that allow them to be or become sophisticated internet users that are more or less immune to, to, to threats. Um, there are many trends in the region that point to a even um, bigger growth of the internet. I mean, penetration overall in the region is around 30%. Our region has huge asymmetries. There are countries with uh, very small penetration rates, and there are countries with over 60% of penetration. Overall, it's around 30. Um, this means that overall, there is 70% that people that are not yet in the internet, but they will probably be soon on the internet. And there's a huge challenge there. Uh, things that are happening in the region that we need to be aware of 
For example, there's a growing trend for e-government. There are many countries with e-government agencies now in our region. Uh, there's a growing emphasis on the internet as a tool for improving transparency and democracy. And that will only happen if we can actually trust the internet as a platform. Uh, there are other trends as well. For example, um, we have all these one laptop per child projects in several countries. Uruguay is a, it's an example of that. Actually, you have some, we have something called Plan Seibal, which actually managed to distribute 500,000 laptops to children, which means that probably in the long term, those children will be sophisticated users, but in the short term, it's a huge challenge again. Uh, this all means that we as technical community have a, a huge responsibility towards our communities. Uh, again, many of the, 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 the things that we need to keep in mind, we have discussed them during uh, this conference and uh, in the last presentations. Uh, again, infrastructure is a key one. Outreach, training, um, and I think we need to capture the minds of the people in the correct way. I, I, keep, I, I get news, um, I mean, if you watch the news or read papers in any country in the region, you will probably have one or two pieces of news every day that have something to do with cybersecurity. And the thing is, most of them are off the point, either because they are overplaying some threat that is not really a threat, or they are probably ignoring things that should be addressed. As Elgelin actually mentioned, one of the main challenges that I think not only our region but the whole world is facing right now when fighting cyber security issues and cyber crime is the issue of cross-border coordination. Actually, this is, is the big elephant in the room that we need to do something about it before it tramples on us. Mm -hmm. the, the, the key here is that Cross-border coordination used to be a thing run by foreign relation ministries with uh, geological times of response, like months or years or something like that. And uh, when basically criminals don't have those restrictions, they can move their attacks from country to country in a few hours or even less sometimes. So again, this is a, a huge thing, huge thing that we need to address in, in, in the, I would say, the whole world. Um, well, basically those were my, my, my opening comments. Um, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, panel. I think um, uh, those are some, some good comments to, to, um, to basically uh, kick, off, um, kick off our session and, and give us a, a sense of, um, of, of what the, the threat landscape is and some of the issues that, that, um, uh, that we're dealing with. Um, from this point on, uh, I want to, to basically have um, questions uh, for the panel.